Good evening, everyone. I'm just going to give it a couple of seconds uh, for people to join in. Okay, let's get started. So uh, good evening. Welcome to um, today's session on the future of arbitration, new and emerging norms at the India ADR Week. Uh, this session is sponsored by Clifford Chance. Um, and of course, uh, you can see all our uh, panelists on the screen in front of you. Um, I will take the liberty of taking the first couple of minutes to introduce them, although I'm sure all the attendees are very well familiar with them. Uh, so my name is Shreya Jain. I'm a principal associate in the arbitration team at uh, SAM Mumbai. Um, and today's uh, panel will be moderated by Nish Shetty, who, uh, of course, is the partner head and, of litigation and dispute resolution Asia Pacific at Clifford Chance. Um, Nish, of course, specializes in international arbitration with a focus uh, especially on restructuring and insolvency related work. Um, I don't really need to introduce his credentials, but we know that he's been uh, a past founder as well as ex-chairman of the SIAC User Council, as well as a co-chair of the Council of Arbitration of MCI. Uh, he was, in fact, the first in Asia to be appointed as a judge in appeal of the FI International Court of Appeal in Paris. Uh, Nish, thank you very much for taking the time to moderate this event. Um, next, I'll take the liberty of introducing Piyush Prasad, who um, also is a counsel at uh, Wong Partnership uh, based in Singapore. He specializes in cross-border dispute resolution. Uh, and I think some of us, or most of us might remember him uh, from his days at SIAC, where uh, he has administered over 200 arbitrations. Uh, welcome, Piyush. Thank you, Svea. Um, Third on my list here um, is Sharon Chong, partner at Screen. Uh, Sharon is uh, has a special focus, of course, on arbitration, but also on aviation-related disputes, uh, as well as insolvency and restructuring. Uh, she has been a past president of the Malaysian Institute of Arbitrators uh, and a committee member of uh, the YCAC. Uh, Sharon was, in fact, uh, appointed to the first ever ad hoc arbitration panel at the 29th SCA Games Kuala Lumpur in 2017, uh, which is which is a feat very few people can speak of. So, uh, Sharon, we are very excited to have you on this panel today. Thanks, Shreya. Uh, next, we have Louis Flannery Casey, who is a partner at Mishcon. Uh, Louis also heads the international arbitration practice uh, and has a particular specialization in disputes involving fraud and conflict of laws. Um, he has, of course, been recognized as a leading arbitration practitioner in almost all international arbitration rankings, and we are uh, uh, very privileged to have him speak at this panel today. Welcome, Louis. Um, you next, say thank you. Uh, next on my list is Andrew Pullen. Uh, Andrew, of course, is uh, at the Fountain Court Chambers and uh, was uh, there at, at was in the international arbitration group at Allen and Overy for several years before he moved. Um, Andrew serves as in the Council of Singapore Institute of Arbitrators since 2017 and is currently serving as the vice president. Andrew, we are very glad to have you on the today. Well, thank you very much. Pleased to be here. Um, and last and definitely not the least, I have the pleasure of introducing Kartike Mahajan, who is the partner in the dispute resolution practice group at Khetan & Co in Singapore. Uh, I, of course, had the privilege of uh, working alongside him uh, when he was at Sam & Co a while ago. Um, Kartike's practice focuses on international arbitration as well as commercial litigation with a special focus on cross-border element disputes. Um, he is also a steering committee member of the SIAC User Council as well as Young SIAC and CPIs by ADR committee. Uh, Kartike, it's very great to see you again here. Thanks, Shreya. Pleasure to be here. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Nish now to carry forward the proceedings. Thank you, Shreya. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I hope you're all enjoying the first day of ADR week uh, in India. Um, I've attended a number of the sessions and they've all been really, really good. I'm 
sure you you caught the Chief Justice's uh, introductory remarks as well, and uh, and his comment around uh, institutional arbitration and the importance of of, of that being uh, more widely used in India. So, for the purposes of this panel, we are we are going to really look at the future, the future of arbitration through the eyes of the panelists that we have uh, before you, and really try and eke out what the panelists consider to be the new and emerging norms in uh, international arbitration. We're going to try and deal with a number of, of uh, uh, subtopics under this uh, broad rubric. Um, we'll see where we get to in terms of time, uh, I know that MCI prides itself on, on being absolutely on time. So I know that we will have uh, an hour from the start of the session and no more. So, so let's get on with, with, with the, the discussion itself. The real sort of subtopics that we're going to start with are use of technology in international arbitration, how that's impacting the, the, the practice of international arbitration. Then we'll talk about uh, new and emerging norms in India and what the future of international arbitration in the Indian context uh, looks like. We'll touch on third party funding. And this is obviously a, a, an area that's of interest, not just in India, but right across the international ar arbitration uh, uh, spectrum. So we'll, we'll touch on that, see how that's uh, looking and, and what the future looks like in, with, with that uh, in, in mind. Then we'll touch on diversity and inclusion in the context of international arbitration, what the, what the trends there are. And finally, we'll, we'll touch a bit on ESG and how that is being looked at by the international arbitration world, where we see uh, uh, those principles playing a, a part in the way that international arbitration is, is, is conducted across the globe uh, and in India. So with that sort of broad uh, roadmap, let's kick off with the use of technology in international arbitration. Now, one of the things that this uh, horrible pandemic that all of us have had to endure over the last couple of uh, years, uh, what that's brought is the use of uh, technology into international arbitration, perhaps in a way that it wasn't used before. And we had to adapt and we did adapt. There was a lot of uncertainty when it all began, how it would all work. It was challenging old norms and the way that these, these hearings would be conducted. Court hearings were, were suspended. But over time, we got used to virtual hearings, virtual platforms. Uh, we liked some, we didn't like others. We are now hopefully uh, at the tail end of the pandemic, I know that's not necessarily the case in every part of the globe, but certainly in many parts uh, of the globe, uh, we are treating this as an endemic uh, situation and we're sort of getting on with life, including in the international arbitration world. So what does the future hold in terms of remote hearings and the use of technology in that context? Uh, perhaps I'll ask Sharon to kick off. Uh, do you have thoughts on, on whether remote hearings have become a feature of the international arbitration landscape? Will they remain a permanent feature? Or is it something that we will discard as soon as we can and get back to sort of physical hearings uh, uh, moving forward? What are your thoughts, Chef? Um, thanks, Nish, for the very good question. Um, I recall the time when the COVID pandemic first hit. Um, and you know, as you said, you know, national courts were either closed with all the trials and hearings suspended, or you know, they were scrambling to get ready, you know, proper infrastructure and system to allow for remote hearing. Um, and you know, we were all as council busy putting together virtual hearings and, and trial protocols for the for the court. On the other hand, what we saw was for international arbitration, it was almost well, almost uh, business as usual. Although for the first uh, couple of months, I suppose, you know, cases did get suspended, you know, as things were quite uncertain and most countries were still under lockdown. Um, but very shortly thereafter, we saw hearings resume virtually. And, um, and, and, and I must say the virtual hearing is not something new in the arbitration world uh, pre-pandemic. You know, we had well, various types of, um, you know, video conferencing facilities even, even then used uh, for, for arbitration. Um, as we see that uh, the pandemic is now, as you said, you know, in the endemic stage and most borders have reopened uh, with minimal to travels with minimal uh, restrictions. Um, you know, that, that is a very good question as to whether, you know, virtual hearings are here to stay. 
And, and for this, I must look back in 2020. And at that time, I recall that I thought and expected that the future would be filled with remote hearings, virtual hearings, even after the pandemic. But I must say that the present is not quite what I anticipated then. Um, you know, as people got used to virtual hearings, I think everyone is just um, very eager to get back um, into in-person hearings um, and, and trials. Um, in fact, in one of the arbitration matters where I'm sitting as arbitrator, the very first week that AIAC reopened and resumed room bookings on their premises, the parties had immediately asked for an in-person hearing. And this was still in 2021 before the borders reopened. Um, so what, what I observe is that parties, council, arbitrators, um, I think still prefer to have in-person hearings and many will still insist on it uh, now that it's permitted and feasible uh, with the lifting of um, restrictions. Um, but a good thing is that the parties are now used to this mode of um, you know, virtual hearings and, 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 and remote hearings. Um, that for preliminary issues or case management conferences, parties are now open to having that um, done or conducted virtually. So I think there is a balance between in-person and virtual hearings. And I think um, parties and counsel and arbitrators um, are all you know, working together to see what is the best way of uh, conducting hearings um, you know, with a minimal cost and, and with uh, minimal delay and how to make use of this virtual infrastructure that, that we've had um, put in place in, in the last few years. Thank you, Sharon. I definitely agree with you. Andy, any thoughts on this? Yes, I mean, I, I, I agree with Sharon in terms of saying there is some movement back towards in-person hearings, but that it is going to be a mixed picture. So I think we've all got we've all got much more competent at using the technology, we're much more familiar with using it, but we still recognise that there are some advantages for in-person hearings for certain types of things. I mean, what, what I think we're going to see in years to come is that anything that pre, pre-pandemic and I'm particularly talking about international arbitrations here, anything that pre-pandemic would have been done over a telephone hearing or, or would often have been done on a telephone hearing, such as procedural hearings, CMCs, sometimes urgent applications for interim relief, that it seems to me is likely to stay virtual uh, for the most part. And um, it's going to be done as we are now on Zoom or a similar sort of platform. Um, it seems to me where there's going to be a bit more of a mix is the substantive evidential hearings, uh, where I suspect we're going to see um, a bit of a hybrid developing. So uh, I've, got, I've got a case where we had a CMC recently. It was uh, the tribunal proposed doing the main hearing in person, and neither, neither party batted an eyelid at that. It's sort of there's a degree of moving back towards that, but with sort of reservation that we might want to have people. Uh, dialing in to observe the proceedings, for instance, uh, the clients or in-house counsel who may not necessarily need to be in person in the room. And, and I think sort of thinking more broadly, um, we may also see some witnesses. It seems to me that there's two major issues here. There's, there's the convenience for the witness or whoever it is in terms of less travel time to get to a to get to the relevant place where the arbitration hearing is taking place and the cost. And it does seem to me that the clients are going to be looking at cost and they will no longer buy the idea that it's Im impossible as it would perhaps have been suggested by people in the past to do a cross-examination virtually. Uh, and I think arbitrators will have to accept that and counsel will have to accept that that can no longer be, be said. There are pros and cons to doing it uh, 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 virtually, but but it's not it's not impossible. And so I think what we might see is a mixture with people in person in the hearing, particularly counsel, the arbitrators, and probably the principal witnesses appearing in person. But but the minor witness who's only on for half an hour, it may be difficult to persuade clients that they should be paying to fly somebody across the world for that. So I think we will see that sort of mix and match approach in future. Yeah, so it sounds like it's not binary, right? It's not either or. And you sort of try and come up with a procedure that will ensure efficiency and cost efficiency. I mean, one of the one of the things that I think all of us are, are facing today is just the sheer cost of travel post pandemic. It's it is extraordinary what 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 travel costs are these days. And I think that will be a feature as well for minor witnesses to have to fly in to an in-person hearing 
to give sort of 15 minutes of evidence or whatever. I think that discussion will certainly need to be had. Piyush, any, any thoughts from your side? Um, you know, I completely agree that we, I have been part of uh, proceedings where parties sometimes are open to it and sometimes they are not. I think now, since it's no longer an unknown beast, you know, uh, because I remember say, be attending these webinars two years ago, what Sharon was referring to at the start of the pandemic, and everybody was like, what is this? How are we going to suddenly, you know, uh, I, although arbitration practitioners have been used to it, but, you know, it was always a question of, are you able to eyeball your witness or not? But I think now, almost three years, two and a half years into it, there is a, a more nuanced approach where you know that it's going to be a straightforward question of law that will decide the dispute. You don't really need to focus much on uh, witnesses and cross-examination. There, I think there is a unanimous consent that, look, we can just go ahead with the virtual application, uh, no problems at all. But yes, certain other disputes where you need, I mean, the witness evidence assumes a lot more importance is where people are leading towards in-person hearings now that that is an option. Uh, but I mean, I, what I'm glad is that the fear of the unknown is, 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 back, is behind us and completely agree with uh, Andrew and Sharon that now it's an option people are more happy to embrace than earlier. Yeah, sure. uh, just, just, just picking up, if I may, on what Piyush said about submissions, it seems to me that that is something where um, the, the the advent of virtual hearings is is something that could give us greater procedural flexibility in future. So one of the things it seems to me that that's developed over the years in international arbitration is a lot is a lot of advocacy is written. Um, we can now have oral advocacy more easily, if you like, by doing it virtually. So you don't need to get everyone in the same room. So that could open up. Um, opportunities to do things that in the past have perhaps been difficult, such as oral closing submissions, where parties may be reluctant or counsel may be reluctant to do it on the last day of, say, a two-day here, a two-week hearing. But if you could come back a week later and orally close, that may be something that that uh, parties might be more inclined to do. And you could do that oral closing virtually, even if you had your witness uh, hearing in person, much more conveniently. Than, than sure. sort of keep everyone in one place. Louis, any thoughts from you on, on this? Yeah. Where do you sit? Um, three different thoughts. Um, number one, the world's happiest arbitrator, I think, um, in 2022, the award must go to Lucy Greenwood, um, <laughs> who, who, who has been struggling to persuade people to cut out air travel and pay for work for a number of years. And finally, her wish has come true. She just, she obviously had something to do with the start of the pandemic because nobody, <laughs> nobody's been a, a better beneficiary. But she has made us all realize when of course for the first six weeks, as Sharon was saying, it was all a bit, uh, holy schmoly, how are we gonna cope with this? Uh, but we all realized that we've done the occasional hearing by telephone or by, by video. It could work, and lo and behold, it did work, and the systems held up. The two, the two other thoughts I had, apart from the fact that it's just such a green thing to do to have a virtual hearing, um, and I've done all of them now. I've done the hybrid. I've done the fully virtual. I've gone um, fully in person. But the other thought is, particularly when you've got counsel in massively different time zones, your hearing day can be so contracted that if it's a two week hearing, it is, it, it's, it's definitely gonna take another week because and I've got one at the moment where our hearing days are four hours because of, the, because of the time difference. It obviously starts, the equation starts to move the other way in terms of that being a factor. If you want a shorter, shorter hearing to get everybody in, in the same room. Then the, the, the third thought was the, um, and I've had this both as tribunal and as council, where the tribunal can easily get in one city uh, because they're all either in, in, in Central Europe or London or somewhere. But one side's council is in a far-flung jurisdiction and the witnesses are far-flung. And the other side's council is also in the same jurisdiction as the arbitrator. Um, what do you do? And in that situation as a tribunal, we've we've moved from bully, from... from um, 
half hybrid, the full hybrid. By half hybrid, I mean tribunal, one side council in the room, other side council virtual. We decided that that was just not being in the room was too much of a disadvantage. So we said to both council, you stay outside the room. We as tribunal will stay inside the room. That and that's that's worked. Um, and the last thought was just that. Uh, and, and Friday was a perfect example of a very heated preliminary measure, interim measures application, very contested, very quite considerable amount of money at stake, but no reason to pull in everybody from all the jurisdictions to, 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 to be in a room physically. So the entire thing was conducted uh, online. And I, I did my bit for Lucy by not asking for a single document in paper. The technology has also improved, I think, massively in the last two years with the, with the platforms that we can now have, the, the downloading uh, and, and the access for the documentation is, is just brilliant. But it is here to stay, no question. There'll, there'll be a slight return. We all like the fact that we're in a conference now, but we're not together. Is a, it, It's a positive in the fact that we're saving the planet, but a negative in the sense that we're not doing that that networking afterwards that gets the relationships that that, that makes the world go round. Absolutely agree agree with all of that. I mean, you touched on other technology. Just to close off this particular topic, um, we're now obviously very familiar with Zoom and sort of similar technologies. Uh, what else do you think is going to be part of the of the international arbitration landscape? in the sort of coming years. Uh, you touched on, on, on sort of digital platforms for communications and the like. Anyone wants to, to sort of crystal ball gaze and, and, and predict what are going to be the tools of the international arbitration lawyers uh, toolkit in the, in the future, or at least in, in the near term? Kartike? Yeah, sure, Nish. Um... I mean, I was just thinking as to what inter international arbitration might look after five, seven years. I think it's obviously very difficult to crystal ball gaze. But what I definitely see with the onset of technology in our arbitrations is platforms like Opus, Epic, you know, those who have become document providers, that document providing service can take the next shape. You know, we, and from those of us who end up doing a fair amount of white collar stuff, you see platforms like Relativity in which there is a lot of coding happening when it comes to discovery of investigation materials. I still haven't personally seen the same kind of tools being applied in an international arbitration, say in a construction case, in which you're looking at volumes of documents. I see some of that playing out, people trying to make those processes more efficient. Obviously, when it comes to cybersecurity, I think that's another stream that some of these document service providers, some of these platform providers will try and ensure that there is strict compliance because there'll be more attacks. So more money, more time will be spent in ensuring all of those procedures are watertight. I think beyond this, I want to get on to the world of blockchain, but I, I will possibly not do so with a lot of trepidation because you just don't know what you're encountering in that world yet. I think there is a lot going on. People are talking a lot about blockchain arbitration and how it can lead to. Uh, I think it's still really untested and we would like to venture into that zone yet. Sure. I mean, you've touched on a, on a, on a bunch of uh, points within this, this subtopic. Um, even on, in, in terms of technology, we talked about sort of digital platforms for, for comms, for file sharing, We've got, we, you, 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 you touched on uh, cybersecurity, which is a huge issue, right? Uh, we, we had one arbitration, I remember, where we disclosed uh, documents as part of normal disclosure, and the other side asked us to use a particular platform, and we agreed to look at their documents, and we just experienced glitches while we were doing that. And we raised that with our cybersecurity team in our in our office, and we found that it, the the other side had actually recommended a military grade uh, uh, file security site that we think uh, they were using to monitor what documents we're looking at. So Ooh. while technology is a great enabler, 
there are also uh, uh, things one needs to be cautious about. So I think when one talks about norms, uh, these issues, the bad experiences, the good experiences of the world then define what the norms should be uh, as, as, we, as we move forward. Now, that's a great segue into norms in India, more domestically. Um, what are we seeing? What are we likely to see in the, in the coming years when it comes to arbitration in India? Um, let me start first with just how arbitrations are conducted. I think it's fair to say for a fair number of years, uh, I'd, I'd like to say before MCIA got, got, got uh, uh, involved, um, a lot of uh, parties would choose retired uh, Supreme Court judges and uh, High Court judges, very distinguished individuals, to be arbitrators uh, of India-related disputes or disputes uh, in India. Um, is that still the trend? Are we seeing a change? Uh, what do we? What does the future look like for for arbitrators in the Indian context? Uh, let me first go to perhaps Piyush. Piyush, what are your thoughts? Um, you know, I've practiced in India, um, and you know, it is often that although arbitration is supposed to be an alternative to what we see in the court system, the the, the traditional mindset to you know when you are approaching appointing an arbitrator you still carry what you practice in the courts. Uh, I think it's, it's more subconscious. Um, so as we're familiar with the judges, you know, uh, seeing them during the daytime, uh, you are also, you also appoint retired judges in arbitrations. That, that has been the trend. Now, as I said, I've practiced in the courts and I've seen, and I, and I can say with confidence that Indian judges do possess vast knowledge of law and have great legal minds. But now let's take a step back and look at the alternate system that we are talking about. Usually when in an arbitration, you will have a, a technical commercial dispute. Let's, for example, take a, a petrochemical, any dispute in relation to a petrochemical uh, complex. Now, the, the determination of this dispute will require certain expertise. Now, if you have a panel of, of uh, arbitrators, of course, the judicial mind will be a great uh, addition to that panel. But at the same time, we also need to look at the particular dispute because arbitration does give you that opportunity to choose your, your arbitrator, your judge. So it need not necessarily be an, a retired judge who may not have all that is required to do justice on that particular dispute because you may have, let's say, an academic uh, and a practicing advocate to comprise the panel along with the judge. So we need to start looking at other uh, individuals with different background yeah. and bring them in. Now, I understand that judges, uh, the courts, as a, you know, while exercising their jurisdiction under Section 11, have been appointing uh, arbitrators who are not only uh, judges, which is a welcome change in the Indian uh, scheme of things. Uh, and even from my experience uh, of working at SIAC, what I saw that uh, we were working on appointing a tribunal, uh, a chair rather, because both sides had, had uh, nominated uh, retired Indian judges. The appointing authority in that case appointed uh, a young advocate, uh, you know, as the chair. I mean, one of the con concerns was also that we need to have diversity on the panel. So I think now that the that, uh, trend is slowly changing, but of course, the, the large uh, part of arbitrator work is, is still with the retired judges. But I think we need to uh, think back uh, and about the particular dispute and you know, come out of the mold of just appointing retired judges. And yeah. I'm glad to know yeah. that uh, Section 11, the judges, uh, the courts are doing so. Yeah, I guess it's also beyond Section 11, right? I mean, if you have institutional arbitration, you have the institution itself assisting in that process. And that's where, you know, for example, MCIA has appointed a whole host of other uh, individuals as, as arbitrators, uh, you know, counsel, uh, female counsels, and, and, and so on. And, and uh, you know, the question really is, is that a trend that we, we see sort of becoming uh, more and more apparent in the years to come? Kartike, what are your thoughts? I mean, you've practiced both in India and in Singapore. Uh, I think Nick, that trend is certainly going to increase with time. And I say that because Indian arbitration has come a long way. 
in the last five to seven years. Since uh, Sri Krishna committee report came about, since there has been a concerted push from all legs of government, whether it be at the executive, legislature, or the judiciary to promote institutional arbitration. And the best way of promoting institutional arbitration is to get those people on board as arbitrators who will lay the right course, right? If you end up appointing people who come with a sense of not of promoting arbitration, but to ensure that they have a retirement job, I think that will never set the right course. I think people who are looking at, you know, coming up with commercial solutions to arbitrations, no matter what their designation is, that is what is going to promote. Now, if you look at the last four years, it's not only MCIA, it's even the Delhi International Arbitration Center who has started appointing advocates, uh, not only the arbit International Arbitration Center in Delhi, but also the Delhi High Court. So there is an increased perception amongst judges thanks to all the training which has been given to them, thanks to all these seminars and webinars, the ones that even MCI is organizing, they are also getting abreast of what is happening at, in the international sphere, what is possibly leading to a bad name with certain aspects of Indian arbitration, and they're trying to correct it. See, India takes its time. India is not Singapore. India is not Hong Kong. It's... Uh, complex, diverse country in which it is trying to come up with new practices which will get established across India. So while Delhi and Mumbai might sign up for something, that doesn't mean all the cities in India will. So it will take some time to trickle down. So you have to give it that time. Thank you. That's, that, I mean, that's really, I mean, the fact that that's the trend in and of itself is huge. Can 10 I, years ago, I, you wouldn't have said that. Yeah. yeah. Yes, can I, no, I'm just I'm loving what I'm hearing from from Karthike and, and Piyush because uh, it's purely um, from my perspective a perception rather than uh, the reality. But I suspect that there has been uh, something of a marriage between the two. That latterly the perception has been from London that if you are an arbitrator in India and you're not a retired judge, you, you don't stand as much chance as a retired judge of getting an appointment. In other words, the, 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 the appointments seem to be hogged by retired judges, a lot of whom aren't as technically savvy as the younger practitioners, and won't necessarily make a better decision maker in that environment because the skill set is so different. Um, we have a, a, a a similar problem in London, but to a lesser extent. In other words, a lot of judges um, are, are looking at this as a, as a second pension to come off the bench and go straight into arbitral appointments without actually understanding that the psychological dynamic of, a, of an arbitration is so different to that of a court proceeding. But it's very pleasing to hear that the trends are shifting, particularly towards the, uh, to the appointment of younger arbitrators. Um, Absolutely. And I think uh, those in the arbitration community and the arbitral institutions have a role to play in ensuring that that trend continues, the capacity is built. Now, I'll tell you, as you know, we do a fair bit of India-related work, and oftentimes we hear this refrain from uh, those that want to appoint an Indian, a retired Indian judge, which, you know, uh, which we, 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 we look at very closely if that recommendation is made. And the suggestion that is made is, unless you have a retired Indian judge on the tribunal, your award won't get enforced in India. Okay. And that, I don't know how that originated, who started that. It is, I, I, unless Piyush and Karthike, you tell me that I'm completely wrong here. I think that's utter nonsense, right? I think the judges these days, are very uh, increasingly pro-arbitration and it won't matter to them whether it's a senior international arbitration practitioner that delivered the award or a tribunal comprising of senior uh, or arbitration practitioners of, uh, uh, as compared to judges, they will look at the merits of the, the application itself. So, but, but these are some of the things that are, that are floating around that sort of uh, lead, to, lead to the perception that you must appoint a, a, a retired Indian judge. And that's why I say it's, there, there is a role to play for those in the community and uh, institutions as well 
yeah. uh, to, and, to and us to, as a role for us. For sure, for sure. Now let me let me sort of move again. We're, we're talking about uh, emerging norms in India, and you know the Chief Justice this, this this morning touched on institutional arbitration, and the fact that we still have to speak about institutional arbitration as a way forward in India tells us that we're not there yet, right? A good number of arbitrations in India are still ad hoc. Um, there is there is a perception that what it, you know, that that's the right way to do it. Is that perception changing? And are we seeing higher value India related disputes uh, going to institutional arbitration? Uh, or, 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 who who has who has some thoughts on on that? Up, Shall go I ahead, go first? I'm sure Please. others have thoughts as well, but let me lay down the groundwork here. I mean, Nish, on this point, I'll make four points. One of them I've already made before, which is that there is a concerted effort on all wings of the state to promote institutional arbitration, starting from the Sri Krishna Committee report in 2017. And what it has led to is some of the effects that we just discussed when it comes to looking at different arbitrators, etc. But now you have very big cases which are going to institutions, like one is which just came about last month, that our firm file, which is the Reliance versus Adani case, which has gone to the MCI, the biggest case that has gone to the MCI. Yeah. And this trend is going to rise. There are three other reasons for it. The second reason is you look at India. India is now the fifth largest economy in the world. In the next five to seven years, you're looking at India being the third largest at a conservative rate of growth. With that comes infrastructure investment. With that comes a lot of money in a particular contract. And when those disputes will come out, they'll be massive. Uh, there is an increasing uptake. This is my third reason. When it comes to institutional arbitration, when it comes to any institution around the world, it has taken them that time to find confidence amongst the parties. I was doing some stats of SIAC two months ago because one of my clients asked me as to how many Indian parties are doing. And I was just, you know, curiously going through the last five, seven years. Uh, and I saw that in 2014, SIAC had 400 odd cases. In 2021, SIAC had 1000 cases. So obviously, over a period of time, it becomes double, triple. And similar stats have come out of MCI, that in the last three years, it's almost doubling every year. So if it keeps on maintaining that rate, obviously, the number of cases will increase. And similarly, there are other institutions which are coming up in India, whether it be a Delhi International Arbitration Center or Hyderabad International Arbitration Center. They are all getting promoted. And you will see an uptick in institutional arbitration. And I think the... Most important thing that I have seen since I have joined an Indian firm is that clients are generally fed up with ad hoc arbitration. And by clients, I mean commercially savvy clients. Obviously, there is a set of clients which are so cost conscious that they think institutional arbitration is expensive than ad hoc, which is obviously a misnomer. Because if anyone has experienced ad hoc arbitration in India, they would know that it is possibly twice more expensive than institutional arbitration. So... They are so fed up that I am now seeing clauses like MCI in my contracts. And similarly, there is at least a discussion to have an Indian arbitral institution in an Indian seated arbitration, not a FIAC all the time, which I think is real progress. And I think when you interact with the clients, that tells you whether they, it is their mindset is progressing or not. And I can tell you that it is. That's really good to hear. That is really good to hear. Look, I want to move uh, uh, to the final point on this that I, that I was going to, to, to ask you all to address. And that is really, you know, one of the complaints I've heard repeatedly uh, about the choice of arbitration in India or, and why parties don't choose arbitration in India is because they feel that the usual um, Indian litigation tactic of running for um, an injunction is the way you conduct uh, disputes in India. So if you win on an interim relief uh, application before a court in India, then you've won quickly. And it doesn't matter if the rest of the litigation you know, uh, uh, lasts for 20 years thereafter. Now, how, how is that being uh, uh, looked at? Is that still the perception? Has there been any change? on that front from an uh, Indian arbitration perspective? What, what does the future look like? Anyone? Um, 
I'm conscious. Andy, what about? I know that you're not an Indian practitioner, but I know that you do yeah. a fair amount of Indian work. So maybe I'll ask you to comment on this. Yeah. Uh, well, I think I think the general the general proposition is is do parties still rush to court? I think some sometimes they do, and we see that in some of the high profile cases. Um, uh, and uh, you can see that sometimes people do get bogged down in, in litigation on the side, but it's not uh, not always the case. And I think what we are also seeing is the Indian courts being increasingly supportive of the arbitral process. And it's it's as I think somebody said earlier earlier things take time. You kind of um, steering the super tanker rather than a small uh, a small boat. Um, but the Indian Supreme Court is very clearly giving uh, a steer in favor of arbitration. And I think we've seen a few judgments in relation to emergency arbitrator awards that I think emphasize that trend and the supportive nature. And I think one of the interesting ones is the Amazon, uh, the Amazon and Reliance Industries case, Amazon and Future Retail, which um, was all to do with uh, whether an, an, an emergency arbitrator's interim award uh, should be enforced and what the what the uh, process for enforcement was uh, and in particular there was a question about whether an emergency arbitrator amounts to an arbitral tribunal in order that his order or award could be enforced in India under the Arbitration and Conciliation Act given that there's no specific mention of emergency arbitrators in the legislation and the Supreme Court's judgment from August of uh, last year I think is a really very well written and very carefully reasoned and clear judgment actually on that. Um, a really excellent one actually, and and um, very pro-party autonomy. So a lot of weight given to the fact that the parties had chosen the SIAC rules in that particular case, which had an emergency arbitrator as part of the process. Um, I mean, actually, it's well, an interesting... Andy, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know the decision, Andy. Is that, a pro that, was, that was upholding a decision of an emergency arbitrator, was it? So yes, it was an emergency arbitrator who granted an injunction um, to restrain the sale of a business to, to Reliance, the sale of future retail, their, their business to Reliance, which is in contravention of a set of a, of share, of a shareholder agreement. Uh, and so there was there was a there was a little bit of a saga over over a period of time with uh, that first going to Delhi High Court single judge who who upheld it and then there was some more litigation but it eventually ended up in the Supreme Court and essentially what the, the I think the key thing which is very important for the future is that upholding the idea that an emergency arbitrator's order is enforceable as a matter of uh, as a matter of Indian law under the ACA um, because there aren't very many statutes around the world that have, have got a reference to an emergency arbitrator in them. Singapore, Hong Kong, I think New Zealand is another one which was cited in that case. Uh, and the judge in that fact, case looked at the definition of arbitral tribunal and looked at some language which you don't see in every arbitration act, but which you see in many, where they have the definitions. They said the definition applies unless the context requires otherwise. And they said the context of the uh, interim relief provisions of section 17 required otherwise and that you give a broader reading to the definition of arbitral tribunal and therefore the emergency arbitrators order counted and and as i say so i think on the technical point that some it seems to me that is a judgment that could be relied upon in other jurisdictions where you don't have um the specific reference to emergency arbitrator but you have a similar provision in the definition section but more broadly for for india i think that just the sentiment and the the really very pro arbitration very pro party autonomy um taking careful note of what the what the rules provided on a few te other technical arguments that were that were run uh, and and rejecting those arguments by reference to the fact that the parties had agreed to certain provisions in the SIAC rules i think that all bodes very well for the future uh, arbitration in general and also for institutional arbitration that it gives real weight to the institutional rules and it's also good paid to this argument that you can only get such relief before the national court and you can you can get this before yep. a tribunal quite often as quickly if not uh, quicker than than before a court uh, absolutely i think i think the emergency arbitrator of all the many in, innovations we've seen going into arbitral rules over the last 10 years it seems to me the emergency arbitration is probably the most successful it, it really works well uh, and i think so the more jurisdictions that are recognizing that and enforcing the orders that just supports the process even more
And the one thing that, what, the, the, again, we won't touch on this now, but I'll mention it is summary determination, which is there in some rules. Um, the, I mean, it, 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 yeah, I can I can sort of disclose that the MCI rules are are going to be looked at and amended uh, to take into account recent developments, uh, yeah, and that will certainly be one thing that we will look at. But but it is one gap that people point to when comparing. Uh, domestic litigation with international arbitration. Mm -hmm. um, can I now move on to third party funding? Um, can I perhaps ask either Sharon or Louis, just talk a little bit about how third party funding has come into the international arbitration world? And, uh, you know, is it good? Is it bad? Is it here to stay? Uh, what, do, what, do you, what do you all think about it? And then perhaps then I'll take it to take it back to India and see in the Indian context whether this is something that, uh, that that we're going to see more of in India. So who wants to go first? I'll have a stab. Um, okay. I actually think that uh, third party funding in, in London terms has probably reached a sort of peak um, in the sense that the market is so saturated and the, the players are so competitive that it's, it's, it's probably, it's not going to have an explosive growth in the last few years because it's already had one. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a beautiful or, or ugly creature, depending on your point of view. Uh, it, it, it's, it, it promotes a sort of claimant uh, friendly approach because only a claimant can get the funding for its claim. And as I say, it's obviously, because the funder has realized that there is a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow that they want to uh, share in the, in the trove. But um, there are cases and a celebrated case where uh, one corporate party was pretty much brought to its knees by another, decided it needed to get third party funding, went out and got it. The usual multiple applied as in three times investment. The arbitrator was asked to award the uh, the uplift the in in effect whatever the party paid the funder. The arbitrator was said that's a reasonable cost, and if you look at the English Arbitration Act, you can probably squeeze it in to the definition. And the arbitrator, none other than a very uh, distinguished retired court of appeal judge, said, "I agree." Um, and awarded the entire amount on the basis that he, he was satisfied that the party didn't really have a, uh, an option. Um, it went to court, and because it went to court, we all know about it because it got reported, it was otherwise would have remained under wraps as an ICC arbitration. Um, and it went to court, and an equally brave judge, now Mr Justice Waxman, um, upheld the award. And so a lot of people have decided to try and shoehorn their cases into that principle uh, to try and recover the funding. It's anecdotal, but uh, it seems that tribunals are, are getting more used to the idea of awarding the uplift um, in a way that judges can't anymore. Judges can't even order an uplift on a, on a conditional fee agreement. So that, that's, there is that to be said for it, but it, but it does represent a tremendously, a, trem a seismic shift towards uh, uh, claimants, as in you know, uh, and a, and a, a body, an effect, an industry that his, its whole income revolves around the party succeeding in arbitration and getting cash. Yeah, I mean, I think industry is the right way to describe it. My own experience with it is that it's becoming a very, a very sophisticated industry. Yeah. They're operating like hedge funds. So the, the yeah. traditional multiple approach is no longer the, the approach that is adopted by uh, a lot of funders. So they do get into the case a lot more. They, you know, work out their financial metrics. Obviously, it's a financial play. Uh, a lot more. Sharon, what, 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 what's your experience been with uh, um, large funding? Well, unfortunately, Malaysia is not um, permitted yet. Um, it is in the works. Um, but, but I do see quite a lot of um, third party funding in other jurisdictions. Um, and further to what Louis said earlier, I mean, we are accustomed to seeing third party funders, um, you know, which funds claimants arbitration costs for a share. 
um, in the in the process of the arbitration. Um, and, and we do see that um, the reasons for using the party funding are no longer the same as before or no longer limited as limited as before, uh, where you know the, the claimant is impecunious and has little or insufficient funds to pursue his claim. Um, we, we see now uh, a lot of um, companies using the party funding um, to free up their company's working capital for other projects or, or more imminent capital expenditure. Um, uh, or for risk management purposes. Uh, but more recently, there are also investors um, in particular investment funds. Um, they are showing a keen interest in investing after the arbitral proceedings are over and after an award has been rendered in favour of the claimants. So this is where um, claimants who do not wish to pursue or continue with the potentially protect, protracted enforcement proceedings, um, they, they will sell their awards um, to a third party, um, typically at a discount, uh, mm. perhaps on the face value of the award. Um, there, there are a variety of reasons as to why um, the award creditor may want to monetize uh, its award. Um, it may be due to arbitration or litigation fatigue. You know, they would have spent you know, number, several years and a substantial amount of money arbitrating the dispute. Um, and, then, and then they only to see the counterparty refusing to honor the, the final award. And, and this is especially so in investment arbitration where the prospect of um, enforcing against a state uh, you know, may be more daunting than, than a uh, you know, private company or even a public company or any company or any, any, any losing party. So we, we, we do see this uh, phenomenon. Um, um, you know, in inter-party funding. And as you say, Nish, I think it's become, you know, kind of a, a very complex and complicated structure uh, uh, matter where, where, you know, we see, um, we see counsel or we see lawyers um, now, you know, specializing in reviewing or drafting uh, the party the funding arrangements or agreements. Yeah. For sure. Thank you, Shad. Karthike, what about the Indian context? Um, Is this coming into the market or not? So let me say this, Nish, that it's already in the market. There are deals happening. And by third-party funding, I'll just broaden the definition a bit. Third-party funding doesn't only mean funding for an arbitration claim. It also means funding for any sort of litigation or a portfolio funding or any sort of, say, a lawyer financing that might be required in a particular case. So in that sense, there is now an Indian fund by the name of Legal Pay, which is established in India, trying to crowdsource funding options and then look at the relevant outside funders who can fund. It's working successfully, apparently, but even outside funders, they're looking at India. But there are certain bottlenecks. Uh, the certain bottleneck, before I get on to the bottlenecks, let me give one minute of quick macroeconomic environment in which I think because of which third party funding will increase. We have just come out of COVID. A lot of companies had their bankruptcies frozen because the Indian Supreme Court had come up with an order that no bankruptcy will take place until further date, as a result of which no one was actually filing insolvency claims. Now, with the federal interest rates going up, you're looking at 4.5% by the end of next year. Uh, you will see wide-ranging bankruptcies with also offshoots into India. And you may see a lot of Indian companies trying to avail third-party funding. But not all funders are looking at India for three reasons. One is the withholding tax concerns in India. So if you are situated outside India, you have to pay withholding tax in India, which obviously eats up into their returns. Second is the Indian rupee depreciation. Any funder who is giving that sort of money is looking at a net IRR of 14 to 15% after currency depreciation risk which is a huge return to be made. And with every year Indian rupee falling, it's very difficult to cap that. And the third is uh, when it comes to enforcement, if the enforcement is only in India, then it leads to court delays, which also deters foreign funders from entering into India. So unless until these bottlenecks are removed, it will be difficult to see a flourishing industry in India. Thank you. That's a very clear uh, answer, Kartike. Now, uh, we've got literally three minutes uh, to go. Uh, I think Shreya will, 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 will close. So in the three minutes, I'd like to see if we can manage to cover two big topics. One is diversity. I really did want us to cover that. And secondly, what uh, Louis touched on briefly, uh, which is really Lucy Greenwood's uh, 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 project around 
you know, greener arbitration. So let's go with diversity first. Over to you, Sharon. Uh, how, how, what does a diverse tribunal look like to you? Are we embracing diversity a bit more in the arbitration world? I mean, I know a number of years ago, we started with the arbitration pledge to have more women arbitrators in, 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 in that position. And I think that's worked. Uh, to some extent, and it's certainly, uh, uh, you know, we see, we see a lot more of that. But what does diversity mean uh, for you, and uh, what are your thoughts? Um, to me, a diverse tribunal is diverse in the broadest sense of the word, uh, from gender, seniority, ethnicity, racial, cultural, geographical location, jurisdictional, to interdisciplinary diversity. So, in the broadest of sense. And I think many of the current efforts to improve diversity are largely at the institutional level. We see a lot more um, appointment of younger um, and female uh, arbitrators. Um, but given the prevalence of the part of party nominated arbitrator appointments, I believe that we must you know, do our role as practitioners to emphasize to clients that diversity is not a mere checkbox, but actually makes good commercial sense. By, you know, by widening the pool of candidates or for arbitrators, we get a broader range of talents, um, and this is more likely to yield better results. Thank you. Um, Louis, on greener arbitrations, is that a direction we need to travel to us? Yeah, it is, but I do want to just follow up on something Sharon has said, because sure. uh, it, it's, it's on diversity and it's less than 60 seconds. 20 years ago, I saw Jan, Jan Paulson at a conference. And he said that he had just uh, been appointed arbitrator with another equally distinguished arbitrator. And they'd taken the decision to appoint somebody almost half their age who was a woman who'd never sat as a presiding arbitrator. So the two wingers agreed to appoint a woman who'd never sat as arbitrator. I have used that exact technique not less than five times. So I have given five women arbitrators a break as first presiding arbitrator. To say that it's down to the institutions is wrong. We can play a part. So I have Absolutely. one where I've just been appointed. I'm about to say to that person, you're old and over the hill. I'm old and over the hill. Let's get somebody who's not old and over the hill, who's never had a presiding arbitrator job, and is a woman to chair us. We can guide that person because we've got the experience. On the greener well arbitration, said. it's easy. Travel by bike, travel by train, <laughs> sail to India. I don't know. <laughs> it's hard. Of course it's hard because we use so many, uh, we leave such a carbon footprint when we get on a plane. But try and, and avoid virtual, it. For virtual arbitration conferences. Yeah, I went up to the Edinburgh Echo by, Echo by train. I did my bit. And I was on the same train as Lucy Greenwood. <laughs> <laughs> there, parading my ecological qualities. <laughs> qualities but it, yeah it's, it's no, hard, but, but we have to yeah. we have to do it we've got to save the planet it's our children's future actually if we if we wrap all of that together if we talk about technology where we started and the ability to use technology in not in a binary fashion to look at each arbitration and see what do we actually have to do then i think the the greener push can can fit within that quite easily if we have that, if we look at it through that lens, then the way that an arbitration should be conducted may become more apparent. I've promised Treya that I will hand the mic back to her uh, for literally the final minute. Uh, I have to thank all of you. I, I think we could have gone on for another hour very, very easily. So thank you all for, for your comments. Shreya, back to you. Thank you, Nish. I, I only take back the mantle very reluctantly because this session was uh, incredibly engaging. Uh, and I have to especially thank all of you for being so candid with your insights um, and, and sort of telling us so many interesting things from your experience, including, I mean, a train ride, which, uh, which sounds very, very exciting. Um, <laughs> but uh, taking cue from Nish, I think, um, and Nish, before I go there, thanks a lot for moderating the panel. Um, I mean, so seamlessly where you cover topics uh, as far off the scale as technology, third party funding, greener arbitrations, more diverse arbitrations. Um, it, it felt like we were all just sort of listening to all of you um, in a very informal setting, but covering very important topics. So that, that's a great, uh, that's a great panel. Thank you. Um, 
I did want to I did want to end with one concluding thought, which I think is how you ended the session as well. Uh, the two important topics of of greener arbitrations and more diverse arbitrations. Uh, that's something the uh, MCI's ADR week is giving a lot of focus on as well. And I know there's a session tomorrow where there's focus entirely on diversity in arbitration. So I hope to see um, our audience attend all of these sessions and and um, uh, in big numbers. Um, but uh, for now. I will bring this session to a close. We've touched the one hour mark. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, I do want to mention that all the videos and transcripts of the India ADR Week sessions will be available on the website, which is www.adrweek.in starting next week. So if you know any of your colleagues or friends who missed attending sessions such as the one today, then they can benefit from these videos starting next week. Um, and I hope to see all of you in great numbers for the remaining sessions as well. So thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.